A very good morning to everyone present here. Abhyangar sir, are you present? Yeah, I have joined in. Thank you, sir. Namaste, Dr. Okay. Good morning. Sir, good morning, sir. Namaskar, namaskar. Nice to see you after a long time. Same here, likewise. Yeah. Lovely to see you. Yes, sir. Same to you. Please go ahead. Thank you, sir. On behalf of Trinity Academy of Engineering, I would like to welcome Dr. Abhyankar Sir, all the dignitaries, heads of the department, faculty members, students, and all the participants of today's event. Trinity Academy of Engineering has organized an impact lecture series. The scheme provides financial assistance to the institutes that are part of the network of Innov Institutions Innovation Council of MOE's Innovation Cell. They organize the impact lecture sessions by inviting external experts for innovation and IPR and startup sessions. These sessions intend to generate awareness and skills among the students and the faculties. I request our principal, Dr. Nilesh Ukesar, to kindly address the gathering. Good morning, sir, and all dear students. Uh, let me first of all welcome uh, Dr. Abhankar and my other all faculty members and dear students. Uh, as we are aware that we have got a little funding from AICT and Ministry of Education. And uh, the first thing came in my mind, I should talk to Dr. Abhankar. He's a well-known personality in, uh, what I say, computer uh, domain, in IT domain in Pune in specific and in Maharashtra in very general. Despite his very busy schedule, uh, he normally uh, and humbly accept our invitation whenever it comes to uh, motivating uh, students for innovation and R&D. I don't want to take a uh, lot of time because I want to listen to him. Uh, I hope our students will get uh, boosted with their morals towards R&D and innovations. Uh, over to you, uh, Alfia. Uh, I would like to uh, listen more from uh, Dr. Abhankar. Thank you, Thank so you much. sir, once again, accepting our invitation. Thank you. Thank, thank you, sir, for inviting. Thank you, sir. Uh, today we have with us as this guest speaker, Dr. Aditya Abhyankar. Sir has many feathers to his cap. He is one of the great personalities who has been delivering lectures for us. Sir has completed his, his PhD in Electrical and Computer Engineering from Clarkson University, USA. He is pursuing his PhD in Sanskrit from Tilak Maharashtra Vidya Sir has completed his MS, MBA, MA in, in Sanskrit Philosophy and B in ENTC. Dr. Aditya Abhyankar is currently working as the Dean, Faculty of Technology and Professor in Department of Technology of SP Pune University. He is lead for his duties as Dean and R&D Director for Center for Excellence in Research and Development, and also the Professor in Computer Engineering Department at VIIT Pune. He is associated as an adjunct professor with COEP Pune, as research associate with Clarkson University, New York, USA, and on an advisory committee and board of studies of many national and international universities. There are a lot of recommendations and a lot of awards received by sir. Without wasting much time, I would like to hand over to sir to kindly start this session. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, very good morning to one and all. I hope uh, you can see me and you can hear me without any trouble. Yes, sir. No issues. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. So at the outset, I would like to take this opportunity and uh, thank the organizers, Trinity College of Academy, uh, Dr. Ukesh sir, and the entire uh, organizing team 
a big thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity to be amongst all of you. And it's always fun to interact with uh, like minded students, professors, researchers and discuss out interesting topics and issues. So it's a wonderful opportunity and I appreciate uh, making me part of this impact series. What we wish to do in today's talk. Uh, so this talk is going to be very, very informal. I want to simply open up my heart to all of you and uh, raise few interesting questions and we will see if together we can form consensus towards answering few of the interesting questions. I'm going to share my screen and, and I will request organizers to kindly confirm that uh, you can see my screen. Just give me a minute. Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. So is my screen visible? Yes, sir. It's yes, visible. Sir. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for confirming that. And we have titled this talk as Research and Innovative Procedures for Creating IPR, which is Intellectual Property. And the IPR is of multifolds. It could be patents, it could be disclosures, it could be copyrights. And that typically results into some tangible form of technology creation. It could be again in the form of licensing or complete end to end technology transfer. And these are the nitty gritties that we intend to discuss in today's session. Like I said, this session is going to be completely informal. So if anybody wants to ask a question at any point in time, just feel free to do so. And I'll be more than happy to address the questions or comments uh, all throughout the session. Uh, first and most fundamental question is, why are we talking so much about research? And to be very honest with you, in my opinion, it's no more a luxury. It has become an absolute necessity. In fact, in my opinion, we all are born researchers. We all are inquisitive. If you look at small kids, they have so many questions in their minds. And there is a popular saying by John Wen. He says that I was born intelligent and then I got educated. Unfortunately, the kind of educational pattern that, that we have imbibed from the British, uh, there is very little scope for being innovative. There is very little scope for doing independent thinking and predominantly the educational pattern that we run in our country today uh, it tests our memory skills how neatly and nicely we can memorize the things and reproduce it at the time of examination however um, as we all know we have adopted bloom's taxonomy and things are moving towards just testing the memorization skills of the students towards testing their understanding and comprehension. And if we really want to understand the things, if we really want to understand the concepts, and believe me, if we understand the concepts, we don't need to buy heart anything. These concepts, they become part of our system. They get into our brain and heart and soul, and they stay with us forever. And that's why there is a lot of fun understanding the concepts. There is a lot of fun expanding the realms of memorization towards comprehension. And that's why research is no more a luxury. In my opinion, it has become an absolute necessity. Having said that, how do we really understand what do I mean by research? And I would like to share a story with all of you. So when I'm saying research, I don't necessarily mean uh, the scientific research in which you have to read papers and then uh, figure out the gaps, uh, come up with your own algorithm and then publish a paper. Sure, that's part of a very systematic and scientific research, no doubt about it. However, what I mean by research is our day to day things in our daily life, in our education, we accept so many things blindly and not accepting the things blindly is what I mean by research. So let's spend few minutes building this foundation and then we'll be talking about innovation and best practices and patenting on top of that. 
However, laying down this foundation is extremely important and let's spend few minutes doing that. And just to make you aware of what research essentially means, I would like to share a quick story with all of you. This story is taken from Greek literature and it's pinned down. It's written by Plato, who was a well known philosopher from Greece. And he has written a number of books and in one of his books, The Republican, this story appears. This story is about two friends traveling in a desert and out of these two friends, one is a blind fellow, so he cannot see, unfortunately. And the other one is a normal fellow, just like you and me. And while traveling in a desert, that normal fellow says, oh, for a cup of milk. And the blind friend poses a question. He says, my dear friend, you are saying, oh, for a cup of milk. Now, cup I know, I have sensed it, I have touched it. But can you please help me understand what do you mean by milk? And this normal fellow says, oh, it's very simple. Don't worry, I will explain it to you. And so he answers back saying that milk is a kind of white liquid. And the blind friend again poses a question. He says, liquid I know, I have sensed it, I have touched it. But can you please help me understand what do you mean by white? The only color I know since my birth is unfortunately black. So please help me understand what do you mean by white? And this normal fellow says, oh, it's very simple. Don't worry, I will explain it to you. So he answers back saying that white is the color of swan's feathers. Raja Haus Namacha jo pakshi asto, tea pakshya cha pankhan cha jo rang to manche pandra rang. So see, instead of simplifying the things, he is unnecessarily complicating them. Maybe he was a professor in one of the institutes. That's just on the lighter vein. I'm sure that all the professors at Trinity, they believe in simplifying the things and simplifying the concepts. But this fellow says white is the color of swan's feathers. And the blind friend again poses a question. He says, feathers I know, I have sensed it, I have touched it. But can you please help me understand what do you mean by a swan? And now this friend realizes that for any and every explanation that he's providing, there is a counter question coming back at him. So this time carefully he thinks for a while and he answers back saying that swan is a bird with a crooked neck. And the blind friend again raises a question. He says, neck I know. Hello. Yes, uh, sorry to interrupt you, sir. Am I audible? Abhankar, sir, am I audible? Yes, you are not audible properly. You are uh, muted. Uh, sir, I'm not there. Okay, okay. Am, am I audible now? Yeah, yeah, you are audible. So, for how long I was mute? No, no, it. So just one minute. Just one minute. Now. Okay. Okay. So um, we're talking about this uh, story about two friends. And this normal fellow realizes that there is a counter question coming at every possible explanation that he's providing. So blind friend asks him a question. You are saying Swan is a bird with a crooked neck. Help me understand what do you mean by crooked? I have a neck. I do understand what you mean by neck, but what do you mean by crooked? And so normal friend really gets irritated. And so what he does is he stretches out hand of his blind friend and tells him that this is what I mean by straight. Tell me, do you understand? And the blind friend says yes. And then he bends that hand in between. And then he says, this is what I mean by crooked. Tell me, do you understand? Very angrily he asks. And the blind blind friend very calmly answers back saying that, oh, now I understand what you meant by milk. So just see from where this started and where they ended. The story is interesting, but what we can derive out of the story is even more interesting. 
So what can we derive out of this? Don't walk in desert. You're in a desert and don't have a blind friend by your sidelines who is pestering you with all those crazy questions. Not really. That's just on the lighter way. What we can really derive and extract out of this story is many times most of us are as blinded as the normal friend in this story. Some with our preconceived notions. Sometimes we are biased about the things. At times we are ignorant about the things. At times we tend to neglect certain things. And research is one such platform where no question, no inquiry is a stupid question or stupid inquiry. There is merit, there is potential in every single question that it is. And that's why research is one platform where you can get of any and every kind of shackle and you can ask any question unless we ask questions unless we are inquisitive and curious about them, we won't be able to really comprehend them and the journey from information to knowledge can never happen and that's why it's very important to raise questions it's very important to ask interesting questions and that that's why it's important to get into the realms of doing research. Raising quality questions, raising good questions, searching questions is extremely important. That does not mean that we should raise questions just for the heck of it, but it's very important to ask searching questions that would result into a good quality research. It is extremely important because unless we do that, we will not get what I typically call as differentiating characteristics. So differentiating characteristics or independent thinking is extremely important. See, we all are born unique. We all are born original. We all are born different. We all are limited editions. We have unique fingerprints. We have unique faces. We have unique voice, gait, speech, keystroke dynamics, there are close to 130 odd biometric identifiers that we carry on our body. Then why we should copy each other? It's important to have independent thinking pattern. And it's predominantly because of the educational system that we have. We get into this habit of copying each other. So much so, I will just give you a couple of examples. Uh, about 10 odd years back, my was in sixth or seventh standard and there was a competition that was organized uh, at uh, Sarasbak by Sakai probably and I had taken her there and the it was a drawing competition and the subject was not an a priori and on the spot the organizers announced the subject would be patriotism and for first five odd minutes all the children, all the kids, they were looking around. And one student started drawing a picture. He drew a tricolor flag. He showed three steps to that tricolor flag. And he also showed two Jawans giving a salute to that tricolor flag. And I was taking a stroll. I was roaming around. And after half an hour or so, more than 95% of the kids, they were drawing same picture. I'm not saying similar picture. I'm saying same picture. Tricolor flag, exactly three steps. I was for a fourth step, but I couldn't find any. Exactly three steps, exactly two Jawans giving a salute. I was searching for a third Jawan or a fourth Jawan, and I couldn't find any because all students were copying each other. That's what unfortunately the educational system does to us. And this is because this system is imbibed from the British. The British never wanted to create thinking manpower. They only wanted to have clerical manpower out of this educational system. And that's why this system hardly provides any opportunities to think differently and challenge your innovative bone. In our school days, what we typically run is scholarship program. And the dictionary meaning of a scholar is a person who is well read, Vyasangi. 
but a well read person, a scholar person may not be innovative. I'm saying may not be. He also could be, but may not be. That person may not be a person who has ability to take risks, go out on a limb, step out of his comfort zone, get out of the groove and uh, go out on a limb, so to say. And it's very important to also provide opportunities for such kind of students. Every student is unique. Every student has its own sweet potential and a scholar person gets good opportunities in the educational system. But unfortunately for innovative students, for students who are bright and they can think little out of the groove, they rarely get opportunities to express themselves in the current existing system. And it's very important that's why to have differentiating characteristics. Otherwise, you will not get noticed. Let's look at the engineering journey. Let's rewind in our minds and let's go back to first standard. From the first standard to 10th standard, we are taught so many things in science, in geography, in history, and many times we accept those things blindly without even thinking about it. For example, we are taught that every particle material is made up of atoms and molecules. And rarely the students get opportunity to actually see those atoms and molecules under the microscope. I don't know how many of you, you have actually seen atoms and molecules under the microscope. We are told that there is force of gravity and there was some scientist and he invented it and he also was able to figure out the constant. We can do simple exercises like hold a ball. For holding the ball, you have to apply equal and opposite force against gravity so that the force of gravity gets cancelled. Then release that ball and catch it. Find out the distance. It is x and find out the time taken dx by dt will give us the velocity d square x by dt square will give us the acceleration and it's a simple plug and play formula and we can find out the constant value of this force of gravity if not accurately approximately but we rarely get such opportunities to do experimentation in school days most of the times our students they end up by hurting the things i'll tell you a funny incidence I was in 10th standard and in maths, the last topic, the last chapter was on shares and there were 10 uh, examples given and my friends, they had literally by hearted those 10 sums because there was high possibility that one of those 10 sums would appear in the examination. So students had literally by hearted those 10 examples, 10 sums. And in one of the examples, the example stated that uh, Ramesh and Suresh owned some XYZ company and the distribution of the shares was in so and so proportion. And the example uh, would unfold uh, after that. Now in the examination, exactly same question appeared, but instead of Suresh and Ramesh, the examiner said Sita and Gita owned this XYZ company and the ratio of the proportionate shares was so and so. And believe me or not, students wrote that the question is incorrect. This XYZ company is not owned by Sita and Gita. It is owned by Suresh and Ramesh. That's what the school education sometimes does to our children. We get into this habit of just memorizing the things so much that the ability to comprehend, understand the concepts, apply the logic diminishes. And it's very important that faculty members and students, we all should be able to bring back that research culture. And believe me, before the Britishers that destroyed our educational pattern, we had that beautiful legacy in our country. If you look at all our scriptures, they are in the form of dialogue. For example, Bhagavad Gita is a dialogue between Krishna 
and Arjun. Many interesting questions were raised by Arjun and even more beautiful answers were provided by Lord Krishna. You look at any scripture, it is in the form of dialogue. Ashtavakra Gita is a dialogue between uh, Ashtavakra Rishi and King Janak. You look at Chandokya Upanishad, it's a dialogue between Uddalak Aruni and Shweta Ketu. It's always in the form of dialogue. And that's because at the root of anything and everything, there was Jidnyasa, curiosity. If you look at the first Karika in Sankhya Karika, it says Dukhatre Bhigata Tadabhighatake Hito Jidnyasa. So there was that curiosity, inquisitiveness factor. The first sutra in Brahma Sutra is Athato Brahma Jidnyasa. And unless there is curiosity, there is absolutely no fun. Students should be encouraged to ask questions. Unless the questions are raised, there is absolutely no fun. And I'm going to uh, show you a few examples where re majority of the research happens by serendipity. And that's why it's very important to have differentiating characteristics. We had created a parody and very quickly I will share that parody with all of you. In 1971, a movie came out and the name of that movie was Bandhan. It was a nice family drama, typical 70s, 80s movie. And the hero of that movie was Jitendra. So Jitendra is for the younger generation is father of Tushar Kapoor and Ekata Kapoor, by the way, a very popular hero of the past era. And uh, his mother's role was played by veteran actress Durga Khote in that movie. And in one of the scenes, the hero comes running back home and says, Ma, my BA pass ho gaya. Now I am Bachelor of Arts, BA. And the mother becomes so happy that instantly she cooks Gajar ka halwa. And that's because in 1971, BA was equivalent to settling down in life. It was passport for getting married to the heroine of the movie and uh, so many other things. Now, if they make a remake of this movie in 2022, and they will, right? Because they have ran out of good stories. So they are only remaking all the olden golden movies. And let's say Ekata Kapoor produces this movie. So the name of the movie will be Kandan because it has to begin with K. And let's say she offers the lead role to her brother Tushar Kapoor. And we can pray to the Almighty that the poor chap will get at least a couple of dialogues because in most of his movies, he's either deaf or dumb. And who will play mother's role? We lost Rima Lagu, but nowadays Madhuri Dikshit has started playing mother's role. So let's say Madhuri Dikshit is the mother. And in one of the scenes, the hero comes running back home and says, Ma, my B.Tech pass ho gaya from a good institute like Trinity. We are talking about smart cities and smartphones. So super intelligent mothers, no gajjar ka halwa. The first question will be campus hua kya? And if the hero says ha ma ho gaya, still no gajjar ka halwa. The next question will be package kitna hai? If the hero says it's a good package they have offered me, still no gajjar ka halwa. The next question will be what are the plans for higher education? GRE, GATE, MADS, HAT, THAT, whatever. And this is because, and this will go on and on and on, and this is because in 2022, just imagine how many engineering institutes do we have in our country? And how many engineers are we producing every single year? And in the professional world, there is literally a rat race out there. And if the students and the faculty members, if we really want to stand out in that professional world, it's important to have differentiating characteristics. And that perspective, we will be able to achieve only through research. And that's why bringing back that research culture in our academic institutes is extremely important. It's not only important at individual level. So I would like to draw your attention to the last two pointers on this slide. It's extremely important to also educate our industry partners. So if we don't have research culture in our academia, it is not going to only impact individuals. It is also going to impact the entire nation. 
it is going to impact different sectors. For example, let's look at one of the fastest growing sectors in our country, which is IT sector. And in IT sector, if I ask you, which is the largest IT company of Indian origin? You can type your answers in the chat box. Which is the biggest IT company of Indian origin? I can't see the chat box. So, any answers? Or you can unmute and say, oh yeah. Tata Trust. Infosys. Yeah, what, what was that? Infosys and Tata Trust. Infosys and Tata, sure. So the largest IT company of Indian origin is TCS, which is Tata Consultancy Services. Infosys is the second largest, and we also have big giant companies like Persistent Systems and KPIT and Zensar and so on and so forth. Now in TCS, it says Tata consultancy services. So we are predominantly into providing services and all these companies, Vipro and Infosys, all the giant Indian companies, they are predominantly into providing services. From providing services to solutions, to tools, to frameworks, to applications, and finally into products, it's a long, long journey. And unless we bring back research culture in our country, we will not have product companies in our country. All the product companies, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, they are based out of Europe or US. And that's because they have very heavy research culture and the companies and the academic partners, they work very closely with one another and that's why they can afford to have product companies in their country. We can have solid schemes coming from government with the likes of Digital India and Make in India, but unless we have research culture, we will not be able to have product companies in our country. And that's why the impact is not only at individual level, but at national level. And that's why it's important to have research culture in our country. We also know that we are in an era of industry 4.0 and that's why independent thinking is going to be extremely important. We know there is some history and the historical piece tells us that the large scaled manufacturing setups in China, they were literally wiping off all the businesses across the globe. And that's why the European Commission came up with this very interesting concept of Industry 4, where the gears have been shifted from scaling to skilling. So instead of having the large scaled up uh, manufacturing setups, now it will be skill based and skill oriented. So instead of having just routine cars, I can now pick and choose and I can come up with my personalized version of a car. So it could be the same car coming from Maruti or some other company, but I can personalize it. And so my car will look entirely different than the rest of the cars. This is the trend that is coming up big time. And that's why the gears have been shifted from scaling to scaling. And if we really have to survive in industry 4.0, where the entire focus is on automation of the processes, artificial intelligence, the adaptation, how quickly you can adapt to the changes is going to be the key. And three Ks, they play extremely important role. Know what leading us to knowledge, know how leading us to skill sets, and know why leading us to vantage. And if you are intelligent enough, we can convert that vantage into an advantage. So ability to quickly adapt, how agile you are, is going to be the important factor in coming few days. And that's why research and independent thinking is going to be extremely important. We are in the most fortunate times. This is the most opportune time we are talking about this because now we have NEP, National Education Policy. Earlier, education or academia 
was never so opened up. And that's why although we had so many other policies like Stand Up India and Digital India and Make in India, it was not possible to integrate those nuts and bolts into our education. But this NEP 2020, it has opened up all these gates. Now education is very open and flexible and it's quite possible to include these very interesting factors in the choice based credit system that we can now afford to have under the realms of NEP. And if we have that, then that would lead us to creation of the complete ecosystem. They say picture is made up of dots. And unless we have the ecosystem in place, and once we have that ecosystem in place, we can then convert not working into networking. And that is going to lead us to having different sets of mentors, IP management, creative thinking, and the smart approach is going to lead us to many startups. Having said that, I would like to draw your attention to something and we need to accept this with a pinch of salt. In fact, with a feast of salt. And this is because although we are talking about Stand Up India, many startups are going to fail and only few startups, they are going to survive and carve out success stories. We have to accept this. However, the failures, they often lead us to uh, learnings because learning happens only out of the comfort zone. And so these failures are not actually failures and we should be able to celebrate these failures. Although there is a company, there is an interesting innovative idea, there is a startup, and even if they don't take off immediately, it's important to keep backing them up, uh, showing faith in their abilities. And eventually after two, three, four, five, six years, they would eventually carve out a success story. In Marathi, there is a popular saying, we say, First failure is the first step towards success. However, the corollary of this is not your second failure is never the second step towards your success. It's important to learn from that failure, provide that feedback into the system. And believe me, all the learning happens outside the comfort zone. And if we really can celebrate the failures, then we can say we have truly brought the research culture back in the ecosystem. You might say, Ah, so much of talk. Are we not doing research? Are we not really producing PhDs and masters and blah, blah, blah? We are. But do we really have research culture in academia, in our industry, in general? And I would like to share a few teasers with all of you. And these are not even concrete examples. These are just few teasers. I will share those teasers with you and then you can think about it. These teasers are connected with two questions that I used to ask as a small kid. One is connected with the concept of keeping time and the other one is connected with the concept of keeping up with the space. And the question that's connected with the concept of keeping time is why do we have 60 seconds in a minute and why 60 minutes in an hour? What is so special about 60? We understand decimal system, so why not have 10 seconds or 100 seconds in a minute and 10 minutes or 100 minutes in an hour? What is so special about 60? That was the first question. And the second question was connected with the concept of keeping up with the space. The calendar system that we follow, why do we get odd number of days in the month of February? Is it not really strange that in the second month of the calendar, we'll stumble upon odd number of days, 28 if we are in the leap year 29, where all other months we get 30 or 31. So I work in the field of machine learning and we write algorithms which are iterative and we say iteration after iteration, the algorithm marches on towards the optimum solution. So there is this popular saying in English, march on. In army, they sing marching songs. We never say January on, do we? So let's play a game. Let March be the first month of our new calendar system. And then April and May. And as it continues, as we are in the seventh month in Sanskrit, seven is Sapta. 
and that gives us September and eight is Ashta giving us October and nine is Navam giving us November and 10 is Dasham giving us December. And it makes a lot of sense because now February is going to be the last month. So it's OK to have odd number of days in the month of Feb, provided we start our calendar in March. In fact, it makes sense because in Mother Nature, new things would start to blossom by around March or April. In Marathi, we call it as Vasanta Ritu, Vasantotsa, Varnal. And it's crazy that not just few of us on this call, but the entire globe, the entire universe follows this logically illogical calendar. What could be the reason behind this? Keep thinking about it. If time permits, I will spill the bins towards the end of this session. But the larger point that I'm really trying to bring out is we have lost this art of asking interesting questions. We are into this habit of accepting the things so blindly. Few of my students, they say, sir, so what? We follow a crazy calendar system. It's not doing any harm to us. So to convince them more, I share a couple of more teasers. The capital of Maharashtra is Mumbai. And before the British came, the capital was at Pune and Satara and Kolhapur. And after the British came, uh, for them, it was very convenient because for them, the most convenient mode of commutation was through sea. And that's why they shifted the capital to Mumbai. And after they left, without even thinking about the consequences, we continued with Mumbai as our capital. It's not even a place, bunch of islands. You have to construct bridges, artificially create land, and then build infrastructure on top of that. And after doing so much so, after investing so much, four hours of rainfall for four inches, good enough to paralyze the city of Mumbai for four complete days. If there is a meeting at Mantrale at 4 p.m., and if I start my journey at 8 in the morning from Pune, there is so much of uncertainty whether I will reach there in time or not. Had we shifted our capital back to one of these cities, we could have saved huge amount of money. If you move a little down south, before the British came, Mysore was a strong capital. The British, they shifted it to Bangalore. Now, all the big cities, they are housed on the banks of rivers. Pune is so fortunate that we have confluence of rivers, Mula and Mutha. Kadachit Mununas. But you have to have river next to it. The only exception to this rule is city of Bangalore or Bangalore. There is no river next to Bangalore. And that's why four states are fighting over Kaveri issue. Who is going to consume what percentage of water? And we have vested or invested crores of rupees just to provide water supply to the city of Bangalore. Had we shifted it back to Mysore, we could have saved huge amount of money, but probably we lacked the thinking manpower. And that's why it's very important to bring back the research culture, not accepting the things blindly, asking searching question is at the heart and core and the crux of doing research. I'm also going to quickly share a couple of other interesting stories and then we'll be talking about patenting. We all know that we are in an era of IoT and I would like to quickly bring to your notice how research happens. Many times it happens by serendipity. We all know we have been using transforms and transforms are at the heart of majority of the engineering applications. And in all these transforms, the kernel function emerges out of the complex exponential, which is a constant E. And if I ask you what is the approximated, because it's irrational constant, but what is the approximated value of this constant? It is approximately 2.7183. So it's not a very handsome, good looking constant. So what is so special about this constant E? Well, something funny happened. 
and I'm going to share with you story of three idiots, but not this one because you have already seen this. But my story is little black and white because it happened in 16th century. And the first idiot in this story is not our Madhavan. So all Madhavan fans, sorry about it. But the first idiot in this story, and by idiot we mean genius, genius scientist, is Dr. Bernoulli. And Dr. Bernoulli was only trying to help out his banker friend and he expanded the formula for compound interest 1 plus 1 upon n whole bracket raised to n and Dr. Bernoulli said let's apply limit so that n tends to infinity and this approximates to 2.7183. So a simple compound interest formula and accidentally Dr. Bernoulli was able to invent this constant. And then comes the second idiot in this story, Dr. Euler, who gave us Euler's identity. e to the power i pi is equal to minus 1. So e is irrational constant, pi is irrational constant, and i is imaginary constant. It doesn't even exist. Square root of minus 1. We know square root of negative numbers, it simply doesn't exist. So it's an imaginary constant. And even today, we don't have a formal proof of this identity. A case of elevated mind, Dr. Euler was able to sense it. He grasped it and gave it back to the world. And because of this brilliant invention, we know that if you plot the exponential curve and if you look at any point, if you draw the tangent, the slope of the tangent is always equal to its y-intercept. And this is what makes all the transforms orthogonal. Another brilliant invention. It happened by serendipity through Dr. Euler. And then obviously Dr. Fourier, the most famous of the trio, who was thinking only about the sine and cos phase. And he told us that if you have a periodic sequence, I have series expansion, a periodic sequence, I have the complete transformation for you. And because of this culmination of thought process put together by these three genius scientists, we today have the complete legacy of transforms. Fourier, Z, Laplace, discrete sine, discrete cosine, and we have constructed so many engineering applications out of these transforms. So research happens by serendipity, and it's important to give that flexibility and freedom in education and academia. I will share with you my own story at Google. Um, I was at Google and I couldn't figure out how they're earning their profits. And then I learned about SEO, search engine optimization. But again, if you if we get time, I will probably explain Google and what they do towards the end of this session. Another case of serendipity, the great, great genius scientist Ron Jen. We all know that he was working on uh, radioactive materials and he had broken marriage. So one fine day, his wife became furious and she came to his laboratory and started destroying his experiments and accidentally her hand fell on one of the radioactive materials and the first modern X-ray image got captured accidentally. You can Google about it and you can also see the wedding ring in one of the fingers of Ranjan's wife. Another piece of serendipity. But research also gives you a clean and honest character. See the honesty of the scientist. He said, he could have very easily said that these rays are invented in my lab, so they should be named after me. But see the honesty of the scientist. He said, I don't know the nature of these rays, so let's call them some rays X-rays. And even today, we call these rays as X-rays. And they have done miraculously well in biomedical imaging. Another crazy case from our own country, Ramanujan, who was working on solving this 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6, going all the way till infinity. This will be equal to what? And what comes to our mind is, since we are adding numbers that goes all the way till infinity, this will be equal to infinity. And Dr. Ramanujan said this, no, this will not be equal to infinity. This will be equal to minus 1 over 12. And people thought he was being crazy. First, why it will be minus and why 1 over 12 does not make any sense at all. And today we know that there is something called as Riemann's hypothesis. And in Riemann's hypothesis, if you plug 
zeta value to be equal to minus 1 then a very special case of riemann's hypothesis results into what was proposed by ramanujan another case of brilliant serendipity and this invention of ramanujan gave lot of inspiration to tesla and we know that there is a universal triangle theory 369 and then there is a universal sequence 1 to 2 to 4 to 8 to 16 that is to 7 and then 32 to 5 and then 64 which is again back to 1 again 2 4 8 so this is called as universal sequence and that has resulted into quantum computing we all know how crazy it has unfolded into interesting applications another beautiful story from england there was this lord and he accidentally supported a farmer's son for his education and later on the son of that farmer became a very popular scientist and son of this lord fell critically ill and the medicine that was invented by the son of the farmer miraculously saved life of son of this lord i am talking about two genius personalities son of the farmer is alexander fleming and he invented a medicine that is penicillin and that saved life of son of this lord and son of the lord was winston churchill who then went on to become prime minister of united kingdom another case of serendipity this is one interesting example and this also showcases how important is it to have openness and flexibility in academia in 1955 after the second world war a very popular uh, professor from harvard what was teaching a course at purdue university the encoding technique that was very popular after the second world war was shannon and fano so this is shannon and this old professor is dr fano and he was teaching a course on information theory and he announced in the class that Uh, there is a class project that has been given and if someone can solve it the student need not write the nsm examination and in his class there was one lazy but brilliant brilliant student and he solved that course uh, project just to save writing the nsm examination and the name of that brilliant lazy student is huffman and he invented huffman codes and as we all know then huffman codes started replacing shannon fano codes because they were much more efficient than shannon fano and even today in different layers of mpeg uh, h.264 h.265 or even scalable codecs which makes use of discrete wavelet transform by orthogonal filters we still have huffman encoding at the heart of it another case of serendipity and this was accidentally invented in a classroom just to avoid writing and some examination another brilliant example from our own country ratan tata a very young ratan tata can be seen in this particular image and right in the center we can see the great great zrd who was also the first aviator of our country and we requested for bomber planes from united states and the us declined giving us the bomber planes so zrd was hell bound on creating bomber planes in our own country and he did that and those bomber planes were much more sophisticated than what was there in the us air force and the same certification we obtained from us air force not just that they also gave us the order Uh, they wanted to buy the bomber planes from us uh, and we were very generous in giving them those bomber planes another case of serendipity and uh, a brilliant invention discovery uh, came about so it's very important to have research culture and it's very important to have uh, flexibility and openness in order to have uh, possibilities of creating serendipities in academic environment uh, i am going to share one more presentation but somehow it's not letting me to share anything so 
can the organizers please make me the host or co-host so that i'll be able to share my presentation yes sir yes wait a minute wait a minute so it says only meeting organizers can present okay sir i'll i'll make it yeah should i log out and log in back yeah 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 now yeah the share tab is active just give me a minute yeah so yes. i have yeah yeah it's more presentation is it, is it visible yeah yeah it's visible yeah so it's very important to once we do some exciting piece of research it's very important to convert it into either a paper or a proposal or a patent and uh, i would like to draw your attention to not the quantity of it so there is no fun saying that i have 3000 papers even if you have few but they are of great quality and they are published in reputed journals then that would make a lot of sense and from that point of view uh, doing quality research and publishing that research in quality journals or coming up with patents that you can convert into a technology transfer is extremely important um it's very it's it's very important to also get rid of few of the misconceptions so writing a paper or proposal is something that we have been doing for quite some time i would like to bring your attention to few of the popular misconceptions the first is of mathematics it's not important if you are building a mathematical model it's important to use appropriate mathematical notation otherwise there is no fun at all in fact the reality is um uh, it's important to keep your paper or proposal non ambiguous and from that point of view it's important to make use of ing verbs use math other misconception is your paper or proposal very hard to read and then probably the reviewer will say oh wow what document this author has created and the paper will get accepted not real the sign or hallmark of a good researcher is to simplify the things so your paper should be easy to read and people should be able to understand it only then it will get accepted third quality is meant than quantity and fourth if you are writing a proposal you should be able to justify your otherwise absolutely no fun um doing this there are quite a few funding agencies these are few of the funding agencies in our country <laughs> icr dst db these are very popular typically know them most of their proposal calls you can just follow their website and a few of the calls are rolling calls few of the calls they are based on the deadlines uh, also csir and ugc please follow their websites but there is a interesting scheme that has been launched so if you look at the point it's rusa it's called as rashtriya uchchatar shiksha abhiyan and they have been also providing very generous funding uh, pay close at tensa website you will get very exciting calls for writing proposals also look at nrb and arb nrb is naval research board and arb is armed research board and they also have very exciting research verticals in which they fund research proposals okay so once you have created a brilliant piece of research and once you have created a research proposal bill me once you write it once it's extremely addictive it requires skill efforts time and eye for detail but once you come up with the first proposal then it's extremely addictive 
and you will definitely keep writing more proposals in future. It's exciting, it's rewarding, and it's very, very interesting. Unless you draw funds for your research, unless you create uh, scholarship opportunities for your students, it's very difficult to create research labs. <laughs> And that's why all the professors, they should really look into writing good research proposals. It's important to look at your piece of research. If it is truly unique, if it is truly Hello. Hello. Oh, yes, sir. You are you are muted right now. Can you hear? Yes, 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 sir. Yes, yes. yes sir. Yeah. So what I was saying is, yes. once you have an exciting piece of research accomplished, look into it. If it has been accomplished, if it is unique, if it is truly novel, if it is useful, and if it is obvious, so these are the three conditions. Then you should seriously think about converting that into some form of IPR, intellectual property, before writing a paper, before disclosing your research on any public platform. It could be written, it could be oral, it could be digital. It could be, but do not disclose your invention. Do not disclose your research findings. And in any public domain, if you really want to, there is something called as prior art search. If you have already disclosed it in public domain, you lose your right, your opportunity to file a patent. And this is very obvious. For example, if you have submitted your paper, to one of the publication houses. It could be IEEE or Springer or elsewhere. Before your paper gets published, after getting acceptance, you have to submit a copyright transfer form. And once you transfer the copyright, that material, that paper, those findings, they are no more with you. They belong to that publisher from that moment onwards. And that's why be very careful before you disclose your invention. If there's something very exciting, something completely novel, useful, and non-obvious. So these are the three conditions. If you have a novelty which is useful and it is non-obvious, if it is obvious, again it is not going to. For example, water tests really good in cold season. That is all obvious so i won't be able to fit so your disclosure your research should be non-obvious to a common person it should be completely novel not tradable, and it should be useful if it is novel but if it is not useful or if you cannot demonstrate its usefulness in terms of your applications then you have to file a patent for filing patent these three things are a extremely important a novelty second usefulness and third your invention being non-obvious so if you have such exciting piece of research then what you should do next what you should do next this is the basic process for filing a patent the first and foremost thing is your institution. If you have a patent cell or an IPR cell, approach them. If your institute, if you don't have an IPR cell, approach the university. At SP Pune University, we have IPR cell. And fortunately, right now I have been given that responsibility. So I also work as IPR chair. And we have a lot of funding for supporting applications that we receive. So typically this is called as. Invention disclosure. All the officers who work at IPR cell. They must 
sign NDA, non-disclosure agreement, and that's why your disclosure remains in safe. Hands. So the first thing that you need to do is approach the patent officer and disclose your invention. So it's called as invention disclosure, and just like patent docket, you will receive a for the disclosure. Once you invention has been disclosed to your patent of then there is a patent review committee and typically they work on your findings and they look into ability of converting your patent into tangible form and then it's converted into a legal document so patent application is typically filed PTO that is Patent and Trademark Office and in India there are four offices the near to us is Mumbai so if you are doing something exciting in Pune you cannot file the patent with Chennai office for example so the only and the near office for all of us is Mumbai and nowadays everything happens online so your patent officer will convert your technical document into a legal doc. All the claims are very neatly brought out. And with every single claim, there is, there is a list of inventors. So patent document is very than your publication. In publication, you can have a number of authors, but in patent document, there are claims, the novelty. And with every single novel claim, there are a bunch of inventors. And those inventors are given credit for those different claims. All the inventors, they get credit for all the claims or few of the inventors, they can get credit for few of the claims in one single patent. And once it is filed with PTO, then the examination happens. These days, the examination happens fast. And if the patent is granted, Fantastic, bravo, well done. If there are certain issues, then you have to address those issues and reappear uh, with a fresh application or, or a more application. And you should keep doing this till the patent gets granted. So this is the basic process for converting your invention into a patent. If you have an invention, the first thing that you need to do is talk to your patent advisor or technology transfer. Sir. So there is TTO, Technology Transfer Office, with every single institute. There is one TTO at SP Pune University. So come and visit us and talk to us. Feel free to do so at any point in time. We have got good budget, good funding to support filing of the patents and also doing the further necessary furtherance of uh, these patents with you. So if you have an interesting piece of invention with you, hesitate to get in touch with us. Uh, the important thing you need is to maintain a very systematic record. There is asked if the PTO assigns an expert examiner. If that examiner wants to go through your experimental setup or the algorithm that you have written or your desktop, your laptop, whatever, then it's very important to keep a very systematic and accurate records of your laboratory findings and that's why make sure that everything that you are doing is very systematically recorded the most important thing is do not disclose the outside party if you are disclosing your invention to any party make sure that they have the a non disclosure agreement signed otherwise they can claim that this work done and we want to have a credit and patent for them. It is not important who did, it's important who files it. And if you have done a good piece of work, you should go ahead and file it and you should not disclose your invention to anyone else. This typical invention disclosure strategy, it's cited by the scientists, the abstract gets formatted, approved by the local research committee, the first proof of inventorship, which is typically reviewed by the patent advisor, and it is referred to the patent review committee. All of this remains confidential, and then it goes to 
PTO. The patent application usually is prepared by the patent advisor and typically the process lasts for one year. It's a very complex document. So instead of you writing the patent document, which is also a legal document, you should let the patent advisor handle it. What you should come up with is a hard technical document very clearly stating what is the invention, what is the discovery that you have brought on table in a scientific manner, technical manner, and file with the PTO office. Uh, the follow up and the procedural part is also being handled by the patent advisor typically. Who contribute in the conceptualization of the invention? And then who also help in converting that ideation into reality, into a practice. Both of these can be in. It could be just pure ideation or could be converting that idea into some feasible form, some tangible form. Both these categories are possible as far as the inventors are concerned. What can be patented is extremely important. You can patent products. So if you have created a product, you can patent that. It could be the same product, but it's prepared using different process. You can also patent that novel process. It could be the same process, but the method is novel. You can also patent that novel method or, or there is a slight tangible improvement in either method or process or product. Then that slight advancement. That slight improvement can also be patented. Four things that can be patented. If you want to file a product patent or a process patent or enhancement patent that is left to the patent advisor and the patent advisors will advise you on what kind of novelty do you have with you. What you cannot patent a laws of nature. So if there is a beautiful law that you can observe in nature, you won't be able to patent that the physical phenomenon. You won't be able to patent the abstract level of ideas unless you really convert those ideas into some feasible form and showcase the applications, the potential applications, the usefulness, you won't be able to patent it. So just the abstract conceptualization, abstract ideation is not good enough to go ahead and file the patent. Anything which is not novel or not useful, you won't be able to patent it. And anything which is offensive, destructive, you won't be able to file a patent for that. So the application has to be useful. Application has to be constructive for the society. Anything which is going to result into a destructive kind of an application, you won't be able to file a patent for that obvious. So on that note, I would like to conclude here. Stating that most of the inventions and discoveries are apparent accidents. And the accidents are bound to happen, but one has to walk the path first. And for walking the path, one has to see the path. And for seeing the path, it's important to raise searching questions. It's important to be curious and inquisitive. I'm sure that you will start brainstorming with like minded professors, like minded researchers, like minded students, and that will result into many interesting technical and scientific accidents. If you hit upon any of interesting technical scientific accidents, please look into a possibility of converting that accident into a patent before you publish it, before you disclose it to anyone. Please look into a possibility of filing a patent. And once you file one patent, then it is so addictive. Like I said, you will keep filing patents. You will keep producing IPR intellectual property rights. So happy researching and happy patenting. If there are any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer those questions. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Yes, dear students, if you have any queries, you can ask. You can type it in a chat box or unmute and
ask the question. Yes, students, you can unmute and or you can uh, type the questions in chat box also. Okay, do think students are uh, not having any queries. So, yes, sir, I have one question yeah. from my side. Yeah, yeah, please, ma'am. Yes, sir. Uh, as a professor or as a uh, lecturer, we just uh, think on research. But right now, for uh, means in the mind of student, there is not much uh, knowledge of research, or student may not get motivated for the research. So, is there any means? Uh, uh, interactive platform which we can use uh, through which we can motivate uh, students to get more and more or, uh, in in the research domain. Yeah, that's a fantastic question, ma'am, and thanks for asking it. I think the most interactive platform is us, the professors. And if we are uh, looking into the active research areas, uh, we can probably showcase those areas to our students and they will get motivated and they will also get into doing research. Like I said, research is a, a frame of mind. It's all here, not accepting the things blindly, asking interesting questions, walking the path uh, till you figure out the answers of those questions. That's what research is all about. And I think to bring the best out of our students first, we need to bring the best out of our own selves. So if the faculty members they themselves get into this habit of asking very interesting questions, making students think in a direction that they have never thought before, then that will lead to pushing them towards uh, entering in the realms of uh, research and uh, active research. Trust that answers the question. Oh. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Sir. Yes, oh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes, any more questions? Okay. Okay, so good afternoon, one and all. I, Dr. Amit Busari, feeling privileged to express the vote of thanks for a, such a wonderful session uh, organized by Institutions Innovation Council of Trinity Academy of Engineering Pune. I express my sincere thanks to Dr. Aditya Abhankar, sir, Dean Research and Development, Faculty of Technology in Savitri Bhai Pule Pune University. Sir, I express my really thanks to you for your valuable thoughts on research and innovations procedures for filing the patents, IPR and copyrights. And also I thanks for your valuable time and knowledge that you have spared with us on the process of patentizing and uh, uh, getting the things uh, in more depth. I also thanks and express my gratitude to Dr. Nilesh Upe, Principal, Trinity Academy of Engineering, for guiding and supporting us for organization of the today's session. Also, at last, I would like to express my sincere thanks to all the head of the department, faculties, participants, and the supporting staff for attending today's session. And again, at the last, I express my sincere gratitude to the uh, organizing team who have made uh, such a great efforts for organizing today's session. Thank you. Thank you all once again. Wonderful. Uh, a big thank you from my end also. It was wonderful uh, talking to all of you. Pleasure. Have a good day. Bye bye. Bye. Good day. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much.